All right, so this episode was with Stephanie Walter. Stephanie is the CEO of Airbay Wealth, and we talk a lot about real estate, obviously, but the majority of the conversation was really about uh, how wealthy invest. They don't invest like we do. Um, <laughs> and I, I think growing up, we're, we're taught to invest a certain way. Uh, the wealthy do something completely different. And uh, she talks about a, a, a couple of the myths in this episode, um, but you can actually get a free copy of her book at her website. And uh, the information is in the show notes. It's also going to be towards the end of the, the uh, episode. But I love talking to her and just kind of picking her brain because, uh, you know, I think a lot, uh, a lot of people, I don't want to say have it wrong, but uh, there's a better way. And she kind of uncovers that and, and talks about how wealthy people invest. So uh, check out this episode and, and thanks for listening. Welcome to Passive Investors Playbook. I'm your host, Charlie Hardage. In each episode, we'll sit down with successful people that turn to real estate to build and grow their wealth. We do a deep dive into why they chose real estate and what makes it so attractive to them. We explore why people in their industry could also benefit from passively investing in real estate. Whether you're a beginner or an experienced investor, a doctor or a professional athlete, love your job or hate your job, our show is here to help you build a profitable real estate portfolio while maximizing your free time and minimizing stress. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn from some of the best in the business. Welcome to Passive Investor's Playbook. All right. Thank you for tuning in today. My name is Charlie Hardage, and you are listening to Passive Investor's Playbook. Today's guest is Stephanie Walter. Stephanie is the CEO of Airbay Wealth, a capital raiser, syndicator, and author of her new book, Shattering Money Myths, How the Wealthy Invest. Stephanie recently retired and sold her insurance agency of 16 years by following the key principles she teaches other professionals to use. She teaches professionals to essentially unlearn what most of us have been wired to believe about money, and she re-educates people on attaining lasting generational wealth. She lives in Colorado with her husband and young son. Stephanie, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. I am extremely passionate about debunking, um, I'll call it a middle-class mindset, but what most people, if they're taught anything, they're typically taught the middle-class mindset. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, do you mind sharing a little bit with the audience a little, uh, little more about yourself? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, no, I started out like a lot of people. I had a, a regular corporate job, uh, worked in, uh, you know, the, that area for about eight years and uh, was uh, about that same time I was taken aside and told that I was doing a fantastic job for the company and I had a long future with them. Uh, and they thought that, you know, I was going to get a 2% raise. And I remember going back to my dad who was alive at the time and just was upset about that. And my dad was like, well, you know, you know what you can expect if you stay with this company, they've told you, or you can go out on your own and what you achieve will be up to you. So I uh, took that advice, gave my two weeks notice and started a business shortly thereafter, the insurance business I was in. I always loved investing in real estate. I didn't have a lot of education at all. Um, I was more a proponent of buying, you know, some, something that I seemed was in a good area, good location and felt like growth would be good. Uh, so I, I purchased like a, you know, a home every few years while I was an insurance agent. And then uh, in 2016, I was invited to a boot camp where they talked about um, syndications and buying apartments. And that's when I first heard that term uh, syndication. And yeah. I was like sold when I heard that. I loved, loved the idea of a group of people buying something bigger than anyone could do on their own. So I just kind of 
immersed myself in that and uh, got, you know, it was about two years of education before I closed on my first syndication. And uh, just then I um, partnered up with my partner, uh, who is we had excellent complementary skills. I was a good money raiser. He was good at finding the deal and running the deal. And from 2018, we've closed on about 12 deals. We have wow. about 300 million of assets under management. And wow. um, yeah, we I guess that's that's the broad strokes. <laughs> So I, I I love that and uh, so you had well let, let's start with the corporate world because I think I think a lot of us unfortunately can relate to that where um, you know maybe you weren't the top top performer but you're probably pretty close and they're like thank you so much here's two percent that doesn't really even pay for groceries that year right especially with with inflation that we've had recently but don't want to get too much into that. No. But two percent is kind of a slap in the face, isn't it? Yeah, it really was. Yeah. And I just bought a house, and you know, there was it was just like you just projected yourself forty years out, and we're like, this this isn't going to work for me. Yeah. So I, I love that you went and talked to your dad, and he didn't say, which, quite frankly, I feel like uh, a lot of our parents would say, "Hey, that's great." you know, you should stick with it. He kind of guided you differently and said, well, do something, uh, do something about it, basically. Yeah. Did w- did he come from um, a business background? Like, did yeah. he have his own well, business? He was uh, actually, my grandfather came over straight from Germany um, and was sponsored by some farmers in Iowa. And once he paid off his you know, debt to them. Then he started um, building several businesses. And then my dad, he worked um, for Great Western Sugar Company in the 70s. So that was a corporate job. And he got to be about my age uh, when I made this decision in his early 30s and was like, same thing. He was like, you know, I'm just done. And he started, uh, you know, have uh, building businesses at that time too. So. Very cool. And I, I know we were talking before the show, um, but Airbe is spelled uh, in the English language E R B E, uh, or maybe that's German. But um, and, and that stands for uh, legacy. Can yep. you kind of talk a little bit about um, what the company does? Uh, yeah, I um, basically work with people to try to expose them to, you know, the different ways that the wealthy people invest and, you know, work on uh, kind of their mindset and plan, uh, you know, plan for retirement. I've always had kind of a soft space in my heart for when I was an insurance agent, I would see a lot of people that were coming to retirement age or quite frankly, a lot older and they really struggled. And that made such an impact on me. I have never wanted anyone to, you know, go into retirement with that kind of, uh, you know, with, with those kinds of finances. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, unfortunately, you know better than I do, but unfortunately that's the case for so many people who are not at retirement age, they're past it, and they're not even close to uh, where they need to be. So um, yeah, it, okay, so um, it means legacy in, in German. Mm-hmm. And I, I know in, in the, the intro, I, I talked about your new book uh, that you've written and how you want to help others achieve not just uh, uh, riches or, or money, but lasting generational wealth. And uh, we both know that uh, multifamily syndication is such a great way to do it. When when you went to that boot camp where you uh, kind of discovered multifamily syndication and probably didn't really know what the word meant, um, what was it about real estate and, and syndication that you just, uh, you were so touched by? Well, I real estate to me always kind of made sense. I actually had my series six and series seven when I was an, an insurance agent. I never invested much of my own money in, in the stock market because I just never felt like I understood why things went up or what, why they went down. And because of that, uh, real estate always made sense to me. It was like, it's a tangible structure. It you know, you get one in a good area. My dad was always saying, you know, real estate will always make you money as long as you don't have a deadline to sell it. 
But um, the syndication was pretty magical because, um, you know, I had been a landlord, you know, for years and years. And quite frankly, that wears on you. (laughs) And um, after working with the wealthy and, and, you know, learning from them, I ended up uh, repositioning a lot of my um, assets that were in single families into syndications because they produce such a greater rate of return. They produce um, wonderful tax benefits and uh, just that cash flow uh, and appreciation, which is which is pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that. And I think mo- most of the guests uh, and, and myself included start in single family because that's what's on TV. Uh, you know, in, in some cases, people think it's the easiest to do, and it's not always. Um, I've been a landlord several times. I, I've liked it zero times. Yeah, <laughs> and I uh, we do have one single family property now uh, that's a rental, and it's just doing too well to to not. Um, not sell it, but it's not 100% passive, right? And I think that's what, um, you know, in, in some sometimes people w- love their job and that's great. Good for them. I'm jealous sometimes, you know, but um, the, maybe it doesn't pay enough or, um, you know, they do have a pension like government employees or, or teachers. They have a pension, but they want something else. And so syndication is a great way that they don't have to leave their jobs, uh, but it, it also helps them in retirement, um, and then I, I really, I, I want to dig into, cause you mentioned the four, um, the stock market and you didn't really know the ups and downs. And I think 99.9% of us are the exact same way. And, and the point one that say they know what's going on might be lying about it, but I, I know you're not a proponent of 401ks. I'd love to kind of hear why, um, I I'm not either by the way, but love to, love to hear your, your, uh, take on that. Well, I mean, I just am going back to what I've seen the wealthy do and the wealthy truly diversify. I think many of us uh, don't know about diversification because we think that means diversifying within the market. Um, what's that, what that really means, if you go to, um, there's a group called Tiger 21, it's made up of uh, very high net worth people. They have to be over 10 million net worth to even join the group. But by joining that group, they agree to release all of their financials every year. So every year, and I believe this is available on their website right now, is an asset allocation. So it's going to uh, describe what these people are invested in as as far as percentages. And every year it's almost identical. Wow. It's about 25 to 30 percent real estate, 25 percent in private equities, 20 percent in public equities, which would be the stock market. So 20 percent of their portfolio is invested as probably a hundred percent of everybody's portfolio is invested in that through their 401k. And I'm not against the 401k. I just, I, I think people need to be diversified and they need to get some of their, they need to be more aware of what their stuff is invested in, in the 401k. They need to move to things like index um, funds that have very low fee structure and they just need to be more aware of, take more control of their money. But definitely, I think everybody, uh, not very many people work the same job from beginning in their 20s to the end when they're in their 60s or 70s. Many people switch jobs. And what I find is the people that leave their 401ks behind, that money is pretty much stagnant. Like yeah. if people look at how those return over time, They don't do well um, because one, because you're not there probably talking to the person to see that it's being invested correctly and managing the fees on it. Um, But an easy thing to do is to do a rollover with with those um, funds and you roll them over into a self-directed IRA. It's a very simple process, very cheap process too. It probably should be uh, maybe a hundred, two hundred dollars to do that, and then you have access to use that money to invest in other things that are not um, related to the market, and that is what the you know the wealthy, by and large, I don't see have four hundred one ks, 
but um, because they have control of their money at all times, they know what they're investing in. And um, so if I could tell someone anything that I've learned from the wealthy is to be truly diversified. And that means non-market, you know, outside of the non-market assets. Yeah. And I, I love that because I, I think with 401ks, it's, they're so easy to do and companies, not all, but a lot of companies will match a certain percent. It's usually small, but it's, it, it's a, a nice return, immediate return. I think the problem with 401ks is there are high fees. There's very little options to invest. You know, I, I think my last job had like 12 different options and most of those were when I was going to retire uh, the the age that I would or the year that I would retire, uh, there's minimal control, right? I, it's not like I could select all these other options. And I, I love what you said too, because I think a lot of us, myself included, are kind of trapped in this of, okay, well, I left the company. Now I'm going to go start a new 401k. My old 401k is still there. And what is really important to know is, and you brought it up, Stephanie, they're self-directed. You can roll that over to self-directed IRA. A lot of different companies would do it, but not the big companies, not the Edward Jones, Fidelities. They don't typically do that. So you would have to go to a custodian, but then from there, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, you know, you could uh, do a lot of alternative investments that uh, that's really cool. And, and real estate's one of those. Um, and I really want to dig into to your book, maybe um, in your book, Shattering Money Myths. Um, that That's amazing. I, I can't wait to get that. Uh, and, and we'll plug it at the end too, but is that available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all that? I don't have it yet up on okay. Amazon just for uh, my uh, my schedule that with my son this summer, but I, I am, it's on my website and okay. I'm offering it a free download. Awesome. But eventually it'll, it'll get to Amazon and everything like that. But Very yeah, good. you can go to my website and, and download it for free. Okay, perfect. And, and again, we'll talk about that towards the end of the show as well. And I'll have that in the show notes, but uh, l- let's dig into this because I, I'm very curious. Um, you've already talked about um, basically what the wealthy do that uh, middle class, lower class don't do, and that's diversify. But uh, in, I, I think you mentioned 25 to 30 percent of their of their investments are in real estate. Only about 20 percent is in the stock market, and I think most people it would be 95 to 100 percent would be in the stock, and zero to five percent in everything else combined. Right. So why do you think, or why do you know that the wealthy do it this way? Like what, what's different in their mind? How do they know the difference and why it's better to, to invest in real estate and, and some of the other things besides the stock market? Um, that's, that's actually a good question. I, I don't think I've ever been asked that. I, I would assume that they take um, the knowledge from the people that either mentors or um, maybe their families before them to know to diversify their portfolios, but consistently they all are. Um, I think another reason is um, one of one of the chapters in my books is about that uh, the myth is is that wealthy get wealthy because they invest in high risk investments, and actually nothing is further from the truth. The wealthy people that I've worked with tend to invest in very low risk investments. If anything, they're wanting an asymmetrical return for the money they put in, but that does not include any losses. They're very much uh, believers in Warren Buffett's two rules of investing, which is rule one, never lose money, rule two, never forget rule one. And I go into pretty detailed uh, description of what the stock market can do when when it loses money. And, you know, people think if it takes a 50 percent loss in the stock market, that 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 it just needs to go up 50 percent just to be even. And that's actually not the case. It needs to go up 100 percent. And so like a 50 or even last year, a 25% loss can mean 
years and years of, of recovery until it gets back to where it was before. So to avoid the losses altogether is, um, is really significant. Um, and that's how wealthy people get wealthy is by um, avoiding loss, really. Yeah, I, I love that. And and I, I love that analogy too. So if you have 10, if you invest $10 in the stock market, it drops 50%. Now your portfolio is worth $5. Mm-hmm. It goes up 50%. Now you only have seven and a half dollars. You don't have that $10 that you started with. And so I love that analogy because a lot of people think it's, oh, well, it's up 50%. So I'm even, but you're not, you're still down. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it takes time to get back there. And then another word, a term that you use, Stephanie, that I I love, and really only since I I got into syndication, I, I've discovered it. But asymmetrical returns, um, that that's a lot for someone like me to say. That's a big word. But do you mind maybe just like a, a couple sentence breakdown of what that means? Well, asymmetrical return is basically a a large return for a small investment. So, you know, maybe $100 and they get a $1,000 return on that. Something that is, uh, you know, is not related at all to the risk, but they're looking at what kind of returns that they get that are better than average. They want the the you know amount of money that they invest to get the best returns possible and those can be asymmetric which means they grow much faster than an average return yeah i i love that term and i think when i when i heard about that and and i was like man that is such a great benefit for and, and what you do as well multifamily syndication but it, it's a great uh, benefit that I, I really didn't even think about uh, until a couple of years ago. And so I love that term. Anytime I hear it, I always love uh, kind of digging into it because it's 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 very, very powerful. And your point about wealthy get wealthy because, um, or, or I'm sorry, the myth about wealthy get wealthy because they have a high risk tolerance is not true. No. Um, they're smart with with their investments and, and it's a super calculated risk. And, um, and then, you know, again, with those asymmetrical returns, uh, more times out of not, they're going to make a lot more money than the average person because they're, they're very calculated and they're not investing what uh, I used to invest in and what most people used to invest in the stock market. Um, so do you have any other, uh, you know, don't want to uh, ruin the book uh, for the, the audience, but I, I'd love to kind of dig into maybe another uh, money myth or, or two. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot there, but love to dig into something else because I, I think that was amazing. Take one, actually, this is one that it's it's the last chapter of my book, and it should honestly, I think it's the most important one um, in regards to wealthy and how they build their wealth, which is tax treatment diversification. And um, many people are like, "Well, what is that?" Well. There, are th- you know, most people have three buckets. Okay, you've got your taxable that that's, you know, where you put money in your savings account, and then to add insult to injury, you you have to pay taxes on that interest every year. Um, then you've got your tax deferred bucket. That's where, by and large, the majority of Americans have all their money in the tax deferred bucket, um, which you know. I'll make a short argument of why that's not a really great, you know, idea. We've got $32 trillion worth of debt right now. Um, That's not even including the unfunded liabilities of Social Security and Medicare. Um, So we've got a major spending problem. And people think, well, our tax rates really, you know, couldn't get any higher than they are right now. I encourage you to pull up a history of taxes since the income tax was rolled out in 1913. If you take it on average from 1913 to today, the average tax rate during that period of time was 58.6. We're currently at a 40%. Um, So you have to think that, you know, raising taxes is going to be a part of the strategy to get everything under control here. So what the wealthy do, which uh, which honestly, until I started working with them was news to me, is they um, invest in tax free uh, income. And this is fascinating to me how they do this. Uh, And in fact, I 
I kind of call it that they, in, and this is true of a lot of wealthy people, they know what they want to achieve with their money and they find products or even create products that give them what they want in the end. And this is a perfect example of that. It's a, most wealthy people can't contribute to the Roth because they make too much money, but they can contribute to what's, what is called life insurance, mm -hmm. which everybody's turn gets turned off immediately, but actually they use life insurance differently than, than most people do. They use life insurance. Most people buy the most amount of insurance that, that their money can, you know, comfortably get them. The, the other way around is um, the wealthy who put as much money into the policy as they can legally with the, with the IRS is, is um, what they do. And, uh, and essentially that grows tax-free and then it gets distributed to them tax-free as well. So it's, it's an incredibly powerful vehicle. They certainly don't have all their money in it, but they have a portion of their money in it. And in fact, they do something that has recently become, it used to be only done by the very, very wealthy, but recently this has become available for accredited investors, which is um, leveraging banks' money into a life policy, which again, I bet no one has heard of this that's that's in your audience because mo most people have never heard of this but essentially the insurance company finds a bank that puts down money into the life insurance policy like a million dollars then the uh the insured puts like 250 over or 200 over the course of four or five years they put it in there so essentially we design these products to grow like crazy and um, the bank ends up getting paid after about 10 years. The insured never has to make a payment to them. So basically the insured is leveraging the bank to fund their insurance policy to give them tax-free income. So it's it's a it's a it's very cool strategy, yeah. but um one that most people have never heard of. But this this takes care of the tax-free income when they retire. I, I love that. So I, I want to recap that. Uh, you, you hit on a lot of amazing points there, and I'm really excited to talk about life insurance. Um, <laughs> but uh, going back to what you said right before that was the, the uh, income tax. And right now, the, the high um, uh, bracket's 40%, but you said it was up to, I think, 58 and a half or so percent. Something's got to give, um, yeah. you know, and, and so your, your point about it, it it could people say it couldn't go up. It definitely can, and, and history has shown that it's been higher than forty percent. Feel like we've been, kind of been hovering. Uh, I don't know if it's thirty-five or thirty-eight uh, percent, but high thirties to forty for a long time now. But it still can go up, and, and something's got to give. So, uh, what the wealthy do, and, and what's really interesting, when I about two and a half years ago started kind of diving into uh, whole life policies, I have um, a couple myself. Uh, my family does, and they are absolutely amazing. A lot of executives in their pay, they, you know, uh, executives and, and large companies make a lot of money, but it's not, it's typically not from salary. I mean, that's part of it. They get stocks, but they also get life and whole life insurance policies. And they're all different. Um, they're not all the same policy, but some uh, insurance companies, uh, some companies will let you basically borrow from that policy and uh, that money that you borrowed is still growing with with interest and dividends too. So um, I, I love that. And if it's structured properly, because again, they're not all structured properly, but if it's structured properly, it can be completely tax-free when you get it out. Um, don't talk to me about that because I don't know anything, but please talk to Stephanie if you have any questions and she can definitely help you out because I I I, I have not heard uh, that last kind of uh, point that you said about how they're leveraging banks. They're leveraging other people's money to get them tax free income down the road. That that's amazing. Yeah, um, and it, it just going going back to the asymmetrical returns right there. Is that a risk? You know, sure, it's a risk, but it's a calculated risk. And I definitely don't know the nuances, but going back to the wealthy get wealthy because of the asymmetrical returns. I, I love that. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. So, uh, so Stephanie, I, thank you. Uh, you. You talked about the um, kind of two of the myths that uh, that you've shattered in your book um, about the uh, the life insurance a little bit and um, that wealthy aren't using uh, don't use high risk investments, uh, but they use asymmetrical um, returns in, instead. Um, those, I, I think, for me and, and growing up again in the middle with the middle class mindset, and, and for probably most of the audience, it's going to be a lot to take in. And, and you know, in, in the intro, we we talked about how you had to un uh, you have to unlearn that as a person. Um, how how do you help your clients and, and your investors kind of unlearn that? And I know just this thirty minutes that we've been recording so far, I'm, I'm sure the audience is like, "Wow, this is great." What are some maybe some other steps that they could take um, to unlearn it? Well, I mean, I think people have to be open to it. I I know that that some people are just you know they're told what they're told and they just believe it. Um, but I think uh, I usually point out um, that they have there are two different mindsets of a wealthy person versus a regular person. And I, I'll i put myself in the category of a regular person uh, because I was one until, you know, recently is I had the view of accumulation. That's how I viewed my money is I was going to accumulate it, uh, going to buy a bunch of rental properties. Uh, didn't really matter how much they were returning to me, you know, may, possibly $100 a month. Um, you know, returns uh, for someone living there. Uh, but put it on the other hand, most people put their money into 401ks and they just set it and forget it. In 20 or 30 years, they're going to be able to have a nest egg. They have no control over it. That that would be completely unacceptable to a wealthy person. A wealthy person is the way that they look at money is utilization. They're using their money any and all times. They're aware of the returns. They're aware of the team they're working with. They're aware of the tax ramifications of all of their investments. And so they take control. They don't give up control. Um, and they their money is working for them. Essentially, I say it's an employee. They look at their money as an employee and saying, what are you doing for me today <laughs> as far as cash flow? or, you know, whatever. But um, yeah, and, I, and until I really examined my money to see what it was doing in those rentals, I had had a lot of um, growth. And yet I was just basically, you know, thinking I was going to hold on to them until 30 years till I retired, and then I'd have this money. Um, but by changing my mindset, I moved to that money. I cashed out of a lot of rent, all of my rentals, in fact, and moved them over into other investments, uh, real estate being, you know, the primary one, but certainly other investments as well. And, um, you know, it, it does take a little bit of work and a little bit of understanding to know how to vet these deals properly. Yeah. But um, it's you have to we have to take back control of our money because leaving it with the financial institutions, they're doing what they do. They're not evil necessarily, but they're keeping our money for as long as they can. They're giving it back to us as as little as they can. And having a retirement that's linked to the IRS or, you know, linked to whatever tax rate we end up being in is a pretty risky retirement. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think in order to unlearn something, you have to you have to the first step would be knowing that there's something else out there. And I think, uh, you know, with, with the life insurance, um, with 401ks and, and things like that, you know, everyone knows about 401ks because there's big money, big marketing behind it. These huge financial institutions, that's what they want you to do, right? And um, they, they've lobbied uh, the government to, to kind of give them, give people tax breaks and, and that's great. Um, but there's other things out there too, right? And, and uh, people like you and me who are doing the multifamily syndication, we don't have these huge budgets. And so I think when people first hear about multifamily syndication, I, I thought it was a scam when I when I first heard about it. And I, I think it's really important to 
um, educate people. And, and obviously that's what we're doing now, but just saying, look, there's other ways. This, this is not the only way. And something that you mentioned uh, about the two different mindsets that I love is, is the middle class is accumulation. How can I kind of hold on to that and, and build it and build it? Well, essentially you're, you're working for your money, right? Uh, over time, you're, you're working for that, working for that. Whereas the wealthy say, no, you're, you're, my money is an extra employee for me. And so they don't work for their money. They have their money work for them. And I heard about that probably seven, eight years ago. I, I heard that phrase seven or eight years ago. I was like, oh yeah, that's cool. That makes sense. But didn't really understand it probably until about three or four years ago. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is way different than what I was taught. That's way different than what most people are taught. So really thank you for breaking that down between the two, two mindsets, accumulation, uh, which is what middle-class thinks and utiliz utilization, uh, which is what the wealthy does uh, because they control their money as opposed to letting someone else control it. So thank you for going over that. Thanks, sure. Um, so Stephanie, I, I want to ask you um, a few other questions. I, I know we, we have a few minutes left. Um, what would you say the company goals of Airbay uh, Capital would be over the next three to five years? For now, for me anyways, I've taken a little bit of a break from, um, you know, our last property we acquired was in July of last year. And we're just kind of kind of sit and wait um, and see what happens with the market. Um, but for me, my goal really now is to work with individuals and um, and you know, get them talking about money and, you know, get my uh, like I am lucky enough to be on different podcasts to just sort of bring up these ideas of money and have people start questioning them and really start, um, you know, taking action on, um, you know, the, these things that could build their wealth. And, and I understand there's a lot of people that are just like, I'm not really interested in building wealth. I just want to have money in my retirement. Well, certainly, you know, not everybody has the same goals at the end of the day, but even talking about, you know, implementing some of these strategies would make your retirement a whole lot better. And so that's really just my goal is to enlighten as many people as I can. I love that. And I, I you know, and, and you said it, but everyone has different retirement goals. Some people want uh, a certain dollar amount. Some people want a uh, certain cash flow. And I think, you know, in syndication, you have a lot of different options. If you want to, you know, depending on how old you are and, and what your goals are, you can sit in the kind of grow and, and build phase. Um, you know, if you're later in life and maybe have some more money, you, you can kind of sit on that preservation. Um, it, and syndications offer kind of the best of both worlds. And 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 I, I love it. Um, I could say a hundred times how much I love syndications and, and just how, how much it's impacted me because there's so many different options. Um, so, um, all, all right. So what, um, you talked about the business, uh, over the next few years and you're at, at this point, because where, where we are in the market, there's not a lot of deals on the market, uh, high interest rates, you know, not, not, not the best, best time to buy or, or even sell at that matter, but, um, you're working with people, working with individuals just to educate them and uh, uh, unlearn them or, or teach them to unlearn themselves. I don't know the, the correct English phrase there, but uh, you want to help people unlearn and help uh, help them relearn the, the right way to do that. So that that's extremely admirable because I, I feel like a lot of people are kind of in it for themselves. And hey, I found a great way to do this. So I'm not going to share it with people. That, that's, I mean, quite frankly, that's how it is in the corporate world, I feel like. Uh, so I think that's very admirable. And I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm passing it along because I had a lot of really wonderful mentors. I still do, actually. And I learned stuff from them every day. They're the most giving, sharing people. That's a myth that actually isn't in the book. But I think that people think that wealthy people are real stingy and, you know, I don't know, above you or whatever. But the wealthy people I've met are, if you show an interest about learning about what they know about, they're so giving and, you know, just sharing of their information. And so I felt like I should, you know, do the same, which is, you know, what, what I want to do is to help people. That's amazing. I I don't know if I've ever really thought about it that way, but as you said that, Stephanie, now now thinking about it, 
especially even on, on my podcast, when I talk to people like you who just have just such a wealth of knowledge, no one's ever said, oh, let's not talk about that, edit that out. It's always been very open and transparent because I think a lot of people, especially in this business, it, it is a team sport. It, it's a team business and they want to help as many people as they can, right? They don't care what background you came from, where you live, who you voted for, anything like that. It's They're, they're all just extremely passionate like you about helping other people. And so uh, I don't know if I really thought about that, but thank you. I mean, that, that that's great and totally makes sense. Um, <laughs> So yeah, thank you. Um, Stephanie, what is, um, b- besides your book, Shattering Money Myths, what is a book that you've recently read that stands out to you? Um, I'm a big fan of Garrett Gunderson. So I like his, um, the, something about the Rockefellers. What, what did, what did the Rockefellers do? Okay. And I'm a kind of a history buff. So I enjoy that a lot, um, which just talks about, you know, making the right decisions, having a legacy with your money. But um, he's also written um, Killing Sacred Cows. And that's a that's a book about mindset about money. And quite honestly, like kind of a lot of what I've been talking about, which is, you know, just how uh, wealthy people have, you know, abundance mindset yeah. and to question you know, these, these financial institutions that have us putting our money in with very little control. Um, certainly I'd, I love that message to get out most of all. Love that. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's great. I've heard about, uh, what, what did the Rockefellers do? Um, I'll have to check. I don't have it. So I need to get that one and then I'll check out the other one that you recommended as well. Um, I want to talk about your book a little bit more. I know we, we, we touched on that, but can you uh, can you tell your website and how to get the book? Yeah, it's uh, www.erbewealth.com. You can go on there and it just uh, it'll that'll be the first prompt is do you want to download uh, Shattering Money Miss and you can go right in and do it for free. Awesome, that that's that's amazing. I'm going to definitely check that book out as soon as we hang up. Uh, we're actually not on a on a phone call, but uh, when, when we get off the call, I'll uh, right. I'm going to download that. Um, and then, uh, what's the best way for the audience to reach out to you? They can go on to the website okay. and and just you know you can reach out to me there. There's a a tab to contact me, and I'm you know happy to happy to set some time aside and and talk to people about their finances. That's awesome. You're you're so giving, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, okay, so just just to recap, that uh, airbaywealth.com, e r b e w e a l t h dot com. That's where they can contact you. Um, that is where they can download the free book, uh, Shattering Money Myths. And I will put all of that in the show notes. Stephanie, thank you so much for being on the show. This was absolutely amazing. Uh, you are just you just have a wealth of knowledge. And I love that you're so open and and sharing and giving with that because uh, it doesn't hurt you to share that, but uh, you don't have to do it. So thank you so much for for just being so open and and honest with the audience today and with me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to today's show brought to you by H&K Investment Group, your home for passive investing. If you want to learn more about how you can invest with us, please check out our website at hkigllc.com. Don't forget to like this episode and subscribe to our podcast. Please leave us a review to let us know how we are doing. Feel free to connect with me directly on LinkedIn or Facebook. As always, I'm your host, Charlie Hardage. Catch you next time.